We're going to continue in our Discipleship Pathway series here at Enon. Our goal for the series is threefold. First, we want to state what a disciple is. Second, we want to illustrate our plan as a church to help come alongside you, to help you grow in your journey as a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and also help you uh, to be able to know how can I help others in their relationship with Christ as we're all sent out to go and make disciples. And then thirdly, just to motivate all of us to take our next step in our spiritual journey. Now, we're going to go into greater detail in the next few weeks about our discipleship pathway and what that looks like as far as our plan here at the church. But I want to give you just a few of those steps this morning. Uh, You see it there on the screen. You see it in the front of your worship guide today. But our discipleship uh, pathway works in sort of a funnel to get us in more small, smaller, intimate groups. And the reality is is that it follows in many ways the model of Jesus' plan in making disciples. You know, Jesus had his ministry uh, to the large crowds, which is often he would preach and minister to thousands. And then he had the 70, which was a fairly large group again, but he would minister among them. And then he had the 12, which was the disciples. And then even among the 12, he had the very intimate relationship with Peter, James, and John. And so if you see the top part of our discipleship pathway is that it starts with working in the harvest. And this is us sharing the gospel and engaging people around us. Our plan here at Enon, it starts with all of us regularly sharing the gospel and engaging people with the message of Jesus. And we need to be in that harvest field. Uh, I heard just this last week that eight hundred over the next three years, uh, there have already been proposed over 800 homes to be built in Morris, Kimberly, and Warrior. God is sending the harvest to North Jefferson, Alabama, to this area. And, and it, all it takes is us to share Jesus with people. So join us this Tuesday night for Go Tell Tuesday. Tuesday and, and as you work and as you engage in people in the community. Tell people about Jesus. Then we have the weekly gathering. And so we talk about the gathering. We talk about the Sunday morning gathering. If people are going to grow in their relationship with Jesus, and we talked about this last week, is part of those markers is that they are connected in the church. And one of the most first and natural places for somebody to get connected in the church is to come on a Sunday morning gathering. And so that's where our plan is, is that we want to share the gospel in the harvest field, inviting people to church. And then the next step is for people to come to the Sunday morning gathering and be a part of that. And then the third step in our discipleship plan here at Enon is then for people to engage in a life group. And so life groups happen on Sunday mornings. They happen at the same hours as our worship time. So if you come to worship at 1030, you could go to life group at 9 or vice versa. And life groups are ways where you can build relationships and connect with other people. Uh, There was a statement that we used at Summit in Arkansas regularly that movements of God happen among friends. And the reality is, is that to, you can only go so far in really connecting with people in the worship gathering. You can't build real genuine friendships just in a worship gathering. We all need to then make that next step to a life group. And that's where you build those faith relationships. And so we'll cover the rest of our plan in the days ahead. But I wanted to give you those first few markers so that you could begin to see our process. But... With that being said, this morning we're going to pick up where we left off last week. And the title of our message is Six Marks of a Disciple of Jesus. Now, our church-wide discipleship plan, it matters, but every good plan is built around a goal. We, the goal must come first. Nobody asks for directions without first having a destination in mind. Our plan is essentially our, 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 our directions, but ultimately our destination, this is our goal as a church, is to go and make disciples of Jesus Christ, to make fully devoted followers of Christ, and for us to be fully devoted followers of Christ. And so what we've been doing is, is we've been laying out what are some, some marks of a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Last week we gave you the first two, which are a fully devoted follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. They have first, they've entered a relationship with Christ. This is somebody who's been born again. They've been saved. And then the second step in that is then they are then connected to a church. And we talked about how baptism and church membership and serving and all of those things take place inside of connecting to a church. This morning we're going to give you the next two, which is a disciple of Jesus is to be biblically led in life, and then also that they are to be spiritually 
growing. So I'm going to ask you to look with me this morning our text, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I invite you to stand with me today in reverence to the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I ask today, oh Lord, what we need more than anything else, to think about what Brother Zach prayed earlier, is that God, we need to hear from you. Lord, we want to walk away from here today, God, having tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And God, we want to be able, Lord, to uh, take those next steps in our relationship with you. God, as we'll mention here in a moment, Go from one glory to the next. And so, God, I pray, or would you ignite a hunger within us, Father, to experience you, God, to to be more invested in in us being followers of you. And, God, I pray, Lord, give us great vision, Lord, uh, for what you want to do in us this morning. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So 1 Peter was written by the Apostle Peter to Christians who were suffering great persecution under the Roman Empire. They were being dispersed. They were living as exiles in the world around them. And they were experiencing this great persecution by the means of some of them were being burned at the stake. Some of them were being crucified. Some of them were being stoned. Some of them were actually being led into the Colosseums there in Rome and outside of Rome where wild animals would be released on them to kill them uh, to the entertainment of the crowds around them. And if Peter writes this letter to them, he is giving them some essentials and how to endure in the midst of this great hardship. Ultimately, he's telling them how they can remain faithful disciples of Jesus even in the midst of such a terrible situation around them. And as we see this morning, we see in that verse there in verse 2 of 1 Peter chapter 2, he gives them two main actions, which are that they should be focused on the Word of God and that they should be invested in spiritual growth. He says to them, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Now here at Enon, as we have been studying over this last year and trying to, to, decide, to discern what are some big marks, some, some big uh, uh, points of reference for us as far as what does a disciple of Jesus look like, consistently we came back to these, the reality all over the New Testament that the Word of God has to be central in the life of anyone who is a disciple of Jesus and spiritual growth has to be a priority For anyone who is a disciple of Jesus. Anybody who wants to follow Jesus, they've got to know the word. And also, they've got to be at a place where they know how to grow spiritually. They're not the same people that they were when they first came to faith in Christ. They have grown into maturity. And so this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off in these marks of a disciple. Where last week we gave you the first two. And this morning, we're going to start there with that third mark of what it looks like to be biblically led in life. So our first truth this morning is this. Our third marker of a disciple of Jesus here at Enon is that they are biblically led in life. And I know for all you note keepers today, if that freaks you out, that our first point starts with the number three. I am so sorry. There was no way around that this morning. So, But as we clearly see in this text, the Word of God is essential to those who want to be disciples of Jesus. Peter uses the terminology, the illustration here, just like a newborn child is what is vital to their survival, their thriving, is the nutrients of their mother's milk. Peter says here essentially that for someone to grow in their relationship with Jesus, the Word of God is just as essential. The Bible all over the world today, we see that the Bible is crucial to our walks with God, and that Christian people, even today, they are facing death just to own a copy of God's Word. Last week we saw uh, when the, the church was birthed there in Jerusalem that one of the first actions that these early disciples of Jesus did was that they started devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching in Acts 2.42. And what they were doing there is by devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, they were seeking out the Word of God. So the Word of God has always been part of those who are disciples of Jesus growing in their relationship with Him. 
And so this morning, I want to give you a few steps in how to be biblically led in life, which is a central part of being a disciple of Jesus. So let me give you a few truths this morning. First, the first step for someone to be biblically led in life is they must submit to God's Word. Now, the word submit submit means basically you yield to someone or some authority in your life. The foundation of submission is recognition of authority. When it comes to submitting to God's Word, it ultimately boils down to the question as to whether or not you believe that the Bible is God's primary means of leading and directing our lives today. And for, in order for us to truly be able to submit to the Bible, we must believe wholeheartedly that the Bible is accurate and authoritative. Now, I could preach an entire series on the authority of God's Word today, but, but I want to give you just a few truths for us to be able to understand that we can trust God's Word, but that also God's Word is still intended to be His means to lead and direct our lives today. So let me give you a few reasons why you can trust the authority of God's Word. First, the Bible affirms itself to be trustworthy. The Bible self-attests. It gives self-proofs that is, it is the Word of God in our lives and it should be trusted and obeyed. In Psalms 119 verse 160, the psalmist spoke about the truth of Scripture and said, the sum of your Word, speaking about all of Scripture, is truth. And every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. In 2 Peter 3, verse 16 and 17, if there were ever two verses that's worthy of memorizing, these are two of them. Paul affirms how the Bible is still God's means and God's authority to lead and direct our lives. It says all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so the man of God, or you could say the woman of God, may be adequately equipped for every good work. Here, here Paul reminds us that the Bible is not just a record of what God has spoken, but it is the record of what God is still speaking, of what He's still wanting to speak into our lives. Also, logic affirms that the Bible is trustworthy. Now, there are many logical facts about the Bible's accuracy and trustworthy that should move us to trust it today. A great book that is worthy of you reading today, uh, it's an apologetic book. It is called Reasons for God by Timothy Keller. If you're here today and you have people in your family, or maybe even you're here this morning and you're a little skeptical about God and the things of God, I encourage you to read that book, read Reasons for God. Uh, let me say this, I have no problem with people being skeptical. I love entering conversations with people who are skeptical. What is frustrating is a lazy skeptic, okay? So if you're going to be skeptical, back it up. Up. Don't be a lazy skeptic. Be willing to read and study those things out. So I would say, read that book, Reasons for God, by Timothy Keller. But in one of the chapters of that book, Tim Keller talks about the trustworthiness of God's Word. Because ultimately, God's Word is our record of how we know about God. He gives a couple of reasons why the Bible is trustworthy. Keller notes that the timing of the Bible is written far too early to be legend and not to be factual accounts. We believe the Bible is not legend, that it's factual accounts of real events. Let me give you one of the reasons he explains there. He says that basically like the Gospels, the, the, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell us about the life of Christ, that they were written no later than 40 to 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus, after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So just 40 to 60 years. And inside the Gospels, there are self-attesting truths that if it was not true, then nobody would have accepted those books in that day as clearly false. But rather, they were commonly accepted because they did have clear examples that people understood was real. Let me give you a good example. In Mark chapter 15, verse 21, it says that the man that helped Jesus carry the cross to Calvary, he had two sons, the father of Alexander and Rufus. And so essentially what Mark is saying in that is, hey, if you don't believe this story, go to Jerusalem, find Alexander and Rufus. Their dad was there. And again, there's so many other self-attesting uh, pictures there that if it was not true, nobody would have accepted these writings in that day. The Bible says that when Jesus was crucified, that darkness came over the earth, that an earthquake took place in that moment. If these things did not happen, then nobody would have accepted these works, but because they did accept them, because people remembered that moment and remembered those days. 
Keller also noted that the content is far too counterproductive to be legend and not fact. Essentially, if you were going to make up a a Bible, if you were going to make up the story of Jesus, then you would have made it better. Like you would have made it more believable. Think about this. The hero of the Bible, Jesus, he died a criminal's death under the Roman Empire. You don't make the hero die a criminal's death. And if you are going to make him die a criminal's death and he raises to life on the third day, then you don't have women to be the first witnesses to see him alive, which they were. And why is that? Because in that day in the ancient world, the testimony of a woman was virtually worthless. And again, that was not correct, but that was the day and time. But rather, they wrote it in such a way just because that's really what happened. How many of y'all reading through the one-year Bible right now? It's great. Praise the Lord for that. If you were going to make up the story of Yahweh, the one true God, would you not make the descendants of Abraham look a little better? You, know? you read the patriarchs, man, and it's like something out of an X-rated soap opera, man. It is bad, you know. But again, God continued to use these people. If you're going to make it up, you'd make them look a whole lot better. Keller essentially is saying here in, this, in, this, uh, in his book is that it is worth reading. It is worth being trusted. And finally, history affirms that the Bible is trustworthy. The record of history shows that the Holy Bible is the most important book in the history of the world. It was the first book printed on the printing press. It is still the reigning bestseller with no challenge. It is the most scrutinized and critiqued book ever, but still remains one of the most factual ancient records, even among secular scholars. But probably the greatest evidence to the trustworthiness of the Bible is its effects that it has had on people for over 2,000 years. For over 2,000 years, God's Word has been changing lives. And all over the world today, there are people that are risking death and that are dying just to have a Bible. People do not die for a book. They die for the God in whom they met in the book. So if we really believe that the Bible is God's word, then we dare not not submit to it. The second step for someone to be biblically led in life is that they must saturate themselves in God's word. When we talk about saturating yourselves in God's word, you're talking about basically making God's word a huge part of your lives. And one of the main ways you do that is to read God's word daily. And over the years in trying to help disciple people, I have found out the two most important things you need to be able to read God's Word daily is you need a plan and you need a place and time in which you do that. And I have found no better plan than a one-year Bible, than to have, a, you have the Bible broken up according to date and you have that day's reading. I encourage you, if you have not joined us in this one-year Bible journey, you can. And let me give you a good hint on that. You're all going to have bad days. You're going to have days you miss. Don't go back and try to make it up. Start at today's reading. If you get a one-year Bible today, don't start in January. Start in February, because if you commit to read a one-year Bible every year, whatever you miss, you'll make up again next year. And it can change your walk with God. And you need a place and a time. You need the regular place where you meet with God's Word. And often, there's nothing that works better than to rise earlier in the morning. Adrian Rogers talked about starting your day in the Word, and he said, no Bible, no breakfast. So if we all committed to that this morning, then uh, we would do a lot better off, I believe. The third step to someone being biblically led in life is that they must set God's Word as their guide in their life. Church, we must remember that God's Word was never intended for intellectual study only. But it was always intended to be a practical guide for our lives in such a way that it would live us and it would lead us to live our lives to avoid actions and lifestyles that dishonor God and to do the actions and things that honor God. When we as God's people read His Word, the Holy Spirit enlightens it in our heart and the Holy Spirit speaks to us about things we need to do. Or the Holy Spirit will speak to you about things you need to not do. Or the Holy Spirit will speak to you about things you need to stop doing. Or the Holy Spirit will speak to you about things you need to know and believe. In Psalms 119 verse 9, the psalmist reminds us how following God's word is the key to how we honor God in life. He said, how can a young man keep his way pure but by keeping it according to your word? Probably the greatest section of scripture that reminds us that God's word needs to be our guide in life comes from James chapter 1 verses 22 through 25. 
Here James tells us that God's Word is meant to be something that leads us to real and actu- action in a real and actionable way. He says, prove yourselves doers of the Word and not mere hearly, hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of a person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty. And by the way, that's what the Word of God is. Yes, it gives us do's and don'ts, but in Jesus, it's not giving us do's and don'ts to cage us. It's giving us do's and don'ts to set us free. It is the law of liberty and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. Isn't that what we want today? We want to live under the blessings of God. Friends, sadly, in this world, we are increasingly seeing that it is becoming popular to separate Christianity from the Word of God. The reasons for this is because the Bible doesn't always fit in with the desires of our sinful flesh and the cultural demands of the day. And we've seen this in every generation. Every generation has had people who claimed to be Christians but ignored or avoided parts of the Word of God, essential parts of the Word of God. They've avoided or they've omitted these things. During slavery or during the season of segregation, there were those who claimed to know Jesus but overlooked the calls of Scripture to love our neighbors as ourselves and to see everyone as a human being created in the image of God. During the era of feminism, there were those who claimed to know Christ, but avoided the truths of scriptures that hold that while men and women are created equal in the image of God, they are different. And being created different, there are different roles and responsibilities that God has given them. And now today, in the modern sexual revolution, there are those who claim Christ, but avoid the truths of God on His design for gender and sexual expression. J.D. Greer said, the Bible offends every culture and every generation just in different ways. He said, it is an equal opportunity offender. That's good. The temptation for every Christian is to celebrate God's truth as revealed in the Bible on everything except the truths that you are at odds with or the truths that are not popular in your generation. The problem with that is is that a Christianity that rejects the truth of Scripture is not genuine Orthodox Christianity. And we need to know that today. There are entire churches that are dedicated that speak to the name of Jesus but deny and reject the truths of Scripture. This is not Christianity. These are hearers of the Word and not doers of the Word. Setting God's Word as the guide in your life means that you must openly let God's Word offend our sinful nature and our cultural norms, and that we adjust our lives accordingly to do and celebrate God's standard as revealed in Scripture, not our standards. This is really important this morning, church. We are supposed to let God's Word change us. We do not change or redefine God's Word. It is the standard. God's Word is the plumb line. This is what it means to have a biblical worldview. Now, friends, this can be hard. Let me say this to you here today. It can be hard to let God's Word offend you. It stings. It can be hard to truly look at God's Word and not walk away as a forgetful hearer, but to look at it. And the Bible says, effectually saying, God, I want my life to be changed according to your Word. But the promise is, if we do that, this man will be blessed in whatever he does. Friends, I want to ask you this question this morning. Where is God's Word offending you that you are ignoring or explaining away or say, surely God didn't mean that? The fourth step for someone to be biblically led in life is they must study God's Word alongside others. I won't say much about this today other than to say that the vast majority of the Bible can speak to us clearly in such a way that everyone can understand. The psalmist said in Psalms 19 verse 7, the testimony of the Lord is simple. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. If you're a new Christian today, if you didn't grow up in the church, that didn't, listen, God's Word can still speak to you today. However, there is a place inside of our 
learning and walking with God where we need to study God's Word further. And to do that, we need the help of other people and other resources who have walked with God further and who have been equipped to help teach and, stay and teach us God's Word. Here at Enon, we do that through life groups, equip classes, and in the days ahead, we will do that through disciple groups. But it is so good when you can dive deeper into Scripture. I ran into somebody just this last Wednesday night. They had went to Brother John's uh, senior adult Bible study that Wednesday morning. And then that Wednesday night, they went to Joe Turner's, uh, Joe Turner's chronological Bible study uh, uh, a class. And they said, man, my heart and my mind is so full. They had taken a deep dive into the Word of God. Friends, a defining mark of a disciple of Jesus throughout history has been that followers of Jesus are biblically led in life. And I want you to know something today. Your soul longs for it, whether you know it or not. Your soul longs to hear the voice of God. It's what we were created for. And God's Word is Him speaking to us today. Just this past year... um, I did kind of one of my bucket list things. I wrote, my, I published, wrote and published my, my first book, and I've, it's been great. I, I've, I've sold tens of them. It's awesome, you know, so. <laughs> but it's done. But one of the first people that I wanted to read my book was my little girl, Ella. She is a just uh, ferocious, ferocious reader. She loves to read. And so I gave her my book, and she read it, and uh, she read it in an afternoon. And she came back that afternoon, and she said, Daddy, I love your book. It was so good. And she was really just petting me up, you know, being encouraging. But then she said something pretty f- profound. She said, you know what, Daddy? When I read other people's books, I, when I don't know the author's, It's my voice that I hear in my head when I'm reading. But since I know you, and since I know you're the author, when I read your book, it is your voice that I hear in my head. Man, I got to thinking about that and thinking about what it's like when we read God's Word as God's people. It's not black ink on white pages. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit of God within us rises up and we hear the voice of our Father. The Bible says, my sheep know my vo- hear my voice and they know me and follow me. So as I read God's Word, I hear God speaking to my soul and there's nothing better for followers of Jesus. You can get up every morning, church, and hear the voice of God. When you face difficult decisions in your life and you need direction and you go to God's Word, you can hear the voice of God. When you get sad or discouraged or feel alone and you open up God's Word, you can hear the voice of God. And so if you're wanting to be a fully devoted follower of Jesus today, you've got to be a people who are committed to God's Word, to be biblically led in life. So that's the first marker we wanted to look at this morning. And then our fourth marker in our discipleship plan of what a disciple is, is that they must be spiritually growing. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, we see that not only does Peter point them to long for the pure milk of the word, but he also tells them so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. Now when Peter's talking about growing in salvation, this is what he's not saying. He's not saying that you're growing to be saved. Coming into relationship with Jesus, being born again, is not something that you work your way towards. When you enter a relationship with Jesus by faith, immediately that happens. All your sin is washed away and you're just as sure for heaven in that moment as any other time. So you are immediately guaranteed a place in heaven. So that happens when you enter that relationship with Him. What he's talking about, though, he's talking about growing in a relationship with your Savior. Grow in respect to your salvation. He's saying grow to know your Savior. You know, growing in your relationship with Jesus is similar to how you grow in your marriage. Kimberly and I will, will be married this year 17 years. I was talking to a sweet couple earlier in the first service. They've been married over 30 years. They just celebrated uh, that anniversary. And, and, and this is when I, I knew my wife really well when I married her. But I know her so much more today, 17 years later. And she has helped me grow, and I've helped her grow, and she's molded me, and, and I've molded her. And she, actually, I told her the other day, I said, babe, you know what? You've, you've done a really good job molding me over the years, and you've almost created me the husband you've almost always dreamed of. You know, like I'm, I'm almost there. But the truth is, is that I, I know her more today than I did when I first came into a relationship with her. The same should be true in our walks with Jesus. Now, we come to know Him when we first give our lives to Christ, but we are supposed to continually get to know Him and grow in our relationships with Him. The Bible has a lot to say 
about spiritual growth. In 2 Peter 3.18, Peter again calls his listeners to grow in Jesus, saying, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to give you a few truths today about the spiritual growth of disciples of Jesus. Our first truth about the spiritual growth is that the goal for disciples of Jesus is for us to grow to be like Jesus. I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's our goal. We, we are intending to grow to be like Jesus. And the Bible gives us several examples of this. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Apostle Paul mentions that the purpose of God saving people was that they might be conformed to the image of Jesus. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. He talks about he's basically to be molded to reflect Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3.18, Paul essentially says the same thing, but he talks about how that is a progressive work. He said, but we with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, Jesus is the glory of the Lord, so you might as well say they're beholding as in a mirror, Jesus, are being transformed into the same image. You see that again, that's that idea of me being conformed in the image of Christ. And this is what he says, from glory to glory. Basically what he's talking about is is that the more that I come to know Jesus, the more that I experience him, the more that I see him, the more that I learn about him, I'm going from one glory to another. I'm growing, I'm progressively becoming more and more like Jesus over time. And for me in my life, I I can see altars where that has happened. Moments where God has spoken to me, moments where God has revealed something to me, moments where God has done a work in my life, and those progressive moments over and over, hardships that I've endured, things that God has led me towards, over big moments of faith, those moments, those altars have conformed me, have made me more like the image of Jesus. And this is ultimately supposed to continually be the goal, is that I would become less and Jesus would become more. Another verse worth memorizing is Galatians 2.20. The Apostle Paul said, For I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's the goal. That is the goal of, of of our spiritual growth, that I would become less and Jesus would become more in me. So that's the first truth of our spiritual growth, that Jesus is the goal. The second truth about our spiritual growth is that the life of Jesus serves as our guide for our spiritual growth. So I want to be like Jesus, and then his life ultimately serves as a guide to help us in our spiritual growth. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 reminds us of this, that when I run my race for Jesus, is that ultimately as I run my race, I'm to fix my eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith. I'm supposed to look to Jesus as my guide and how I need to grow in my relationship with him. It is, it is, it is like looking at the, the life of Jesus and the scriptures. And, and ultimately Jesus fulfills all of the scriptures. So as I'm affirming his life, I'm affirming all of the scriptures. As I look at him, then he reveals to me areas that are deficient in my life. And then I can change and adjust in accordance. Now there are so many ways that we could look at the life of Jesus to help guide our spiritual growth. But I want to give you a few Ways that you can do that even today. First, the holiness of Jesus should be a guide to us today. The Bible says that Jesus was perfect in his obedience to God, his holiness before God. He was perfect. And so as I look to Jesus, it should cause me to look at my own life and attempt to turn from sin more and to obey God more. In this life, let me say this to you Christians, in this life, we will never be sinless. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. That we're always going to battle with our flesh. But the longer I walk with Jesus, I should be attempting to sin less. Does that make sense? I'll never be sinless, but as I grow, I should sin less. I should begin to strive for greater victories over sin. So the holiness of Jesus should be our God. The communion with the Father that Jesus had should be our God. The Bible shows us that Jesus and the Father were one. That there was a constant connection, a constant relationship between him and the Father. And that should be something we long for, as Paul talked about, to go from one glory to the next. And I want you to know something today, church. If you've gotten dry in your walk with God, you feel like you've kind of hit a spiritual season. You feel like we're a spiritual ceiling. You feel like you don't know where to go next. Know this this morning. There's another glory for you. 
There's another, there's another experience of Jesus. You can know him more today than you did yesterday. I mean, don't settle for several years ago was my best time with Jesus or in high school or I was in college or when I first got married. These or, or before I got a divorce or I, or I got messed up or I made some bad decisions. Those were my best moments with Jesus. In him, there is a new glory for you today. He wants you to know him more even today. Just this last week, during the fast, that's one of the things we're fasting for. Jesus, let me fall in love with you more. I was sitting right there on that front row. And I came over here during lunch, and I was praying and meeting with the Lord. And, and I just sat there, and I just said, Jesus, I just, I just want to meet with you. And listen, it, was, it, was, it took a minute. Like there were those moments I felt like I was wrestling in my prayer a little bit. But finally, I felt like I kind of pressed into the presence of the Lord. And I felt the Holy Spirit just lay on my heart. Zach, just open your Bible. So I just opened my Bible up and it opened up to the story of the woman with the issue of blood that reached out to Jesus and touched the hem of his garments. All she did was reach out and touch the hem of his garment. And immediately the power of God came out of Jesus and healed her. And in that moment I said, oh Lord Jesus, I just want to reach out and touch you right now. And it was no sooner that came out of my mouth that I felt the presence of God just envelop me on that front row. And I just sat there for probably half an hour and I couldn't even really speak. I remember saying the only thing I could get out of my mouth often was just praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. You're just so good. But it felt like God just wrapped me up in that moment. Friends, I went from one glory to another glory. I just had a moment in the presence of God. And then the selflessness of Jesus should be our God. The Bible says that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. If there's anything that should help us as we grow in Jesus, we should grow less selfish and more selfless. Some of the most spiritually mature people that I know, their lives are marked by not how much that they are served, but by how much they serve other people. Isn't that true? When you look at some of the most Jesus-filled, godly people, you know they're just servants. And why is that? Because as you grow in spiritual maturity, it's not about you anymore. I've been crucified with Christ. It's not longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And where does the Spirit of God lead you? To be more selfless. With Jesus as our God, you remember the 1990s when the bracelets came out, the WWJD bracelets, what would Jesus do? Now listen, we can't ever, and we will not ever, be able to do it just like Jesus did, okay? He was perfect. But that's still a great question to ask. Lord, what would Jesus do in this moment? And then our final truth about spiritual growth is that a disciple's spiritual growth will be filled with victories and defeats, but will ultimately be completed in glory. How many of us in this room understand what it means to have spiritual victories and spiritual defeats? Can I get an amen to that today? We hear the words of that hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. And why is that? Because when we come to faith in Jesus, we talked about this last week, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within you. God comes and lives within you. But you will always in this life have a sinful flesh that is bent towards evil. The Apostle Paul talked about the battle between the spirit and the flesh inside of every Christian. He said, but I say to you, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are in opposition to one another so that you might not do the things that you please. Basically, Holy Spirit inspired scripture says here that there is a war going on within you between the flesh and the spirit. And this is what we battle as we try to spiritually mature, to try to grow. And in verse 24, Paul tells us how we have more victories. He said, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. With his passions and the desires. We've got to kill the flesh. We have to do that. And that's hard. Because that sinful flesh doesn't want to die. Billy Graham gave a great example of how to win that battle more. Have more victories in that battle. He said that battle between the flesh and the spirit is like having a big black dog and a big white dog inside of you fighting. Whichever one you feed the most is the one that's going to win. Often one of the greatest ways to crucify your sinful flesh is to starve it out. Until ultimately it dies. Let me say something to you. When we do it God's way, we can see victories and you can grow in your relationships with Jesus. In just the last few weeks during this season of prayer and fasting, I had a church member reach out to me and asked if, if he and his wife could come by and meet with me. And I said, uh, you know, I usually I counsel people on Wednesday nights and seasons when I'm not teaching on Wednesday nights. Uh, can we make your appointment then? And they said, uh, then I usually ask, but is it urgent? And they said it was urgent. And I said, okay, so we move things around. And 
had him come by and sit down. And in that conversation, the man confessed to the fact that he has been struggling with alcoholism for over a decade. And he's been able to successfully hide that from his family and from his children. But as he came during this season of prayer and fasting, which again, God is working and moving during this season of prayer and fasting, is that God moved in his heart to finally begin to pursue freedom and not do it on his own, but he confessed it to his wife and said, I need freedom. I talked to him just this last week. He is 10 days sober, and he said he's never gone that long in over years. God is bringing freedom. And why is that? Because he did it God's way. He started praying. He started getting in God's word. He started seeking counsel with getting in some groups. But most importantly, he did one of the hardest things for all of us in our spiritual growth. He recognized he couldn't do it alone. James chapter 5 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. And what he did is he brought it into the light. And that's where he took the power of the devil away. These are all tools that God can use to help us. But let me say this to you this morning as we prepare to close. Our greatest weapon in our battle over sin, our spiritual maturity, is hope. It's hope. See, often we get discouraged in our relationships with Jesus. We get excited about following the Lord. We want to do better. We want to get in God's Word. We want to sin less, and we start doing those things. But what happens? We have some failures. And somewhere along the way, we take the gospel, and we we take it backwards, and we feel like we are trying to work towards God's love. And that's not the gospel. The gospel was Jesus saw me dead in my transgressions and sins right in the middle of my worst moment. He said, I love you. The gospel says that Jesus loved us in our worst moments. And then now my efforts in trying to grow spiritually, I'm not growing, I'm not growing uh, try to towards his love. I'm growing from his love. Because Jesus loves me so much already, I want to attempt to try to mature and grow in my relationships with him. I'm not growing to try to make him love me. And so it's the difference in fighting from victory or towards victory. See, as Christians, we're not fighting towards victory. You're fighting from it. And so, yes, you have failures, but there's still hope on the horizon of a better day when this war, this battle with the flesh will not win. It's already defeated. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 through 57, 51 through 57, Paul speaks about the greatest, our greatest hope as Christians, and the day when we will struggle with the sinful flesh no more. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In the moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. You hear that? You know what that change means? It means that struggle with your sinful flesh, it will change. It's not going to be the same anymore. For this perishable must put on imperishable, and this mortal will put on immortality. He said, I'm going to take that flesh body, and I'm going to get rid of it, and I'm going to give you a glorified body that doesn't have a tendency towards sin anymore. And when this perishable will I put on imperishable, and this mortal will I put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. I want you to hear something this morning. All you weary, struggling Christians who you feel like, man, I'm too much of a failure to try to grow anymore. I mess up more than I succeed. I want you to know that Jesus knew that when he saved you. And he said, I'm never going to give up on you. And one day, everything that you desire, that the Holy Spirit longs for in your relationship with Jesus, you will have because your faith will be your sight. And God's going to take that old body and he's going to get rid of it. And he's going to give you a new glorified body. And so we shall always be be in the presence of Jesus. That day's coming. So take hope. Even when you fail, you can look at the devil and say, yeah, devil, you won this one, but Jesus has won the war. And you can get up the next morning and start walking in his grace and his mercy. I'm going to ask our instrumentalists to come. And as they come, I want to close. I want to tell you this story because what we're talking about, spiritual growth and even diving into God's word is about us being disciples, and it's about us learning and following Jesus more, experiencing Jesus more. D.L. Moody, who was a famous evangelist and pastor in the Chicago area, God was using him mightily, but then the great fire of Chicago wiped out a lot of their ministry space, a lot of their ministry, and they were struggling. 
and they were struggling financially. Their people were struggling. His ministry was struggling. And so he, he went to New York to basically start meeting with friends and people to try to start raising money for his ministry. And that's a real humbling place for anyone. When you're going around, feel like you're begging. And so he was already beat up, but then he's in a situation where he's beat up even more. He's having to put on a good face even when he's struggling. And he said he's walking down the streets of New York, and he was so low. But he just called out to Jesus, and he said, God, I just want to feel you. I just want to experience you. He reached out like that woman with the issue of blood. And he said suddenly the presence of God wrapped him up so much in such a real way that he stopped walking. He leaned back against a building on the street in New York. He laid his head back against it and he just sat there in the presence of God. He felt the nearness of Jesus so much so in that moment that his prayer then changed. This is what he prayed. Oh Lord, stay thy hand lest I perish. Lord, it's just too much. I can't take any more. If I get any closer, I'm afraid that I may die. Friends, I want you to know something today. Jesus wants you to go from glory to glory. Through His Word, through your spiritual growth, He wants to, for you to know Him more. And that's why we pray, that's why we fast. To know Him, to behold His face, to walk into His presence. In His presence is fullness of joy. So in the days ahead, as we call up making disciples, that's what we're asking for. We're asking a disciple of Jesus is somebody who's diving in. They're wanting to know God more. They're hungry. And what happens to hungry people? And they get filled. So this morning, this is what I want to ask you. If you're a follower of Jesus today, but you had not been hungry in a while, maybe you'd say, oh God, create within me a fresh hunger for you. And let me be desperate for it. Maybe you kind of played around with the fast, but maybe this week you say, you know what, I need to really get hungry before God. So I'm going to press in and fast. Maybe this morning you need to get inside of God's Word. Get one of these one-year Bibles before you leave today. Or maybe you need to progress in your spiritual growth. You've kind of lagged there for a while and you take some real steps towards God. But most importantly this morning, maybe you don't know Jesus. That's where it begins, by the way. It begins in that moment where Jesus becomes real in your heart and life through faith. And he washes you of all your sin. And he takes you from being an enemy of God. He brings you into his presence and he saves you forever. That's real, by the way. That's real. He can save you this morning if you don't know him. And if you want to know him right now, you can. As we sing here in a moment, just call out to him and say, Jesus, save me. I want to know you, oh God, save me. I give my life to you. If you need somebody to pray with you, our pastors will be up front. If you'd like to join this church, you feel free to come. If you call out to Jesus and you say, I need some help, man, take out one of those, uh, one of those blue connect cards at the seat back in front of you. And right on there, I gave my life to Christ today. Or, or I need to follow through in baptism and my spiritual growth and honoring you, whatever that may be. You write that down. But if you need to come this morning, you feel free to come. I'm going to ask you to stand right there where you are. Oh, Lord, I ask in Jesus' name, would you speak and move in the lives of your people today for your name and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Come now as we sing if you need to come.